Wow, Victoria, that was fabulous. Indeed, all of our piano students this morning, you have really enhanced our worship. And let me tell you something. There's no better use of your talent and your ability than the service of God. You did that this morning. Let's give one more applause to all of our piano players. This morning, I, I'm not starting out as I normally do with the Job because there's a certain gravity to what I'm going to be talking about because it was one week ago about this time in a small one-light town of Sutherland Springs, Texas where a congregation was getting together to worship just as we have this morning when at 11.20 a.m. David Patrick Kelly started shooting his rifle outside of their doors and then he made his way into that church There is video footage. They worship and do the same thing we do. They put a video camera in place so they can show their worship service uh, through the internet. And that video camera apparently shows as Kelly came in and just started shooting anybody and everybody. He methodically went down the aisles and shot all the people that he could, stopping only to reload his semi-automatic rifle. Twenty-six people were killed. Twenty more were injured, some very seriously. Kelly once attended a a First Baptist Church, you know. It was in Kingsville, Texas. He even volunteered for VBS back in 2014. But it was soon after he left that church, almost immediately, that he started to post atheism online. Indeed, he started calling us who are Christians, we who are believers, he began to call us stupid and simple-minded. And although there's some speculation about his motives, the common observations are that Kelly was a very angry and a very vengeful person, having threatened to kill several people in his lifetime. On October the 12th of this year, I joined with a group of people as we planned the worship service for today. I'd already selected the portion of Scripture that we're to use, and I please invite you to turn and have your Bibles open to 1 John chapter 3. That was the portion of Scripture that was already selected on October the 12th. But God, in his omniscience, already knew what I should preach on this day. And for those of you who have been in this congregation, you know we've been dissecting and looking at different lines of the Lord's Prayer And so it was the Lord had planned this week that I would preach on the line, deliver us from evil. And so I was posed with the question, what happens when evil walks into the place of worship, walks into a church and kills so many worshipers just like us? How on earth were these people delivered? How were they rescued from evil? Indeed, the question might even be asked, did evil win in that story? Today we'll look at that first epistle of John, that that third chapter. We'll look at the story that it refers to, the story of the first murder, of brother against brother. And through this portion of scripture, we will try and make sense of the prayer, deliver us from evil. Join with me as we pray together. Gracious Lord, it seems we're living in a world that struggles to even shock us anymore. And as horrific as the events of last Sunday were, we'd kind of seen this before. Yet, Lord, for us, we who are Christians, we who are believers, perhaps this one did hit home a little more readily. There's a vulnerability, perhaps, that we now might feel as worshippers. But Lord, help us to today analyze and make sense of what happened in light of what your word says. In light of the prayer that we've so often prayed, deliver us from evil. Heavenly Father, just give us a level of understanding today of where you might have been in the midst of all of this. And to realize, Heavenly Father, that you do continue to deliver us from evil. 
Open our minds, open our hearts, and prepare us for this message, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, the story of Cain and Abel is horrific, but quite brief in that it's 15 verses of Genesis chapter 4, followed by about eight verses that talk about the descendants of Cain. But we know the story, don't we? Abel was the shepherd. The older brother Cain cultivated the ground. They both brought gifts before God. Abel brought the the best portions of the firstborn lambs. Whereas Cain brought some of his crops. That's what scripture said, just some of his crops. And it says the Lord accepted Abel and his offering, but it did not accept Cain and his offering, causing Cain to get angry and dejected. And so Cain eventually took out his anger and dejection on his little brother. So what we see here is the first thing that happens to Cain is he was not accepted by God. But but God said to Cain, if you do what is right, you will be accepted. So the rejection of Cain and his offering meant that he wasn't doing right. There was something that was wrong that was going on. And and we see this condition in his heart. Of course, we see it get much darker, as did God, as he goes on to say, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. That's what God said to Cain. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You must rule over it. But soon that sin that was crouching at Cain's door manifested itself in his heart causing him to become so hateful, so full of hate, that he murdered his own brother. John talks about that in chapter 3, verse 12 of our text. It says, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. You see, the acceptance of Abel lay in his righteousness. John says that. Genesis 4 implies it, and the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 4, makes it very clear where he says, by faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. So if you're not righteous, then surely we must be what we consider inherently sinful, or if you will, evil. And surely that's what God was talking about with regards to to Cain. And surely that's why God rejected the offering of Cain. Cain's heart wasn't in it. He was kind of going through the motions. I can't tell you why Devin Patrick Kelly attended church for a couple of months in 2014. I can't tell you why he decided just for one night to help with VBS. But I think I can say with some certainty his heart wasn't in it. He'd already got a string of misdemeanors for assault on his, his wife and stepson, for making death threats against his superior officers in the U.S. Air Force, for cruelty to animals. He'd already got this string of misdemeanors before that brief time of going to church. And therefore, I can't tell you why his brief attendance at church would cause him to turn against the church in such an awful way. But I would suggest it's the same thing that caused this married man to turn against his wife. This dog owner to turn against his dog. This member of the U.S. Air Force to turn against his superior officers. And indeed, I believe it's the same thing that caused one brother to turn against his brother. It's evil. John asks in verse 12, why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil. And his brother's were righteous. John then goes on to say in verse 13, do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. For Cain, his rejection caused jealousy. His jealousy turned to hate, and his hatred turned into this heinous murder of his own brother. For Abel, however, bless his heart, there was no chance to reconcile. Now I would imagine there was difficulty in their relationship prior to this. This was just really where it manifested itself, where it came out. But Abel certainly had no clue as to how bad things were with Cain and his heart. Why else would he have been so ready to go with Cain when he said, let's go out into the fields? 
The loving heart of Abel couldn't imagine the darkness that was inside of Cain's heart. And that gentle heart with its natural naivety would have been even more infuriating to Cain, causing the, the hatred to spill to jealousy or jealousy to hate and the hatred to indeed turn into that terrible murder. For Cain, ill will had caused its own form of revenge. Indeed, Matthew Henry says, ill will will teach us to hate and revenge what we should admire and imitate. Listen to that. Ill will should teach us, will teach us, excuse me, to hate and revenge what we should admire and imitate. So the ill will we are sensing, the ill will that we are receiving from the world out there, quite frankly, is to be expected. John says, do not be surprised if the world hates you. But the line of the model prayer that we're looking at today is that line that says, deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. But in light of the events of Sutherland Springs, Texas, of the awful shooting that went on, can we really pray that prayer with confidence? After all, it was seen there are 26 people there that were not delivered from evil, but were victims of evil, just as Abel was a victim of evil. In that church, there were 10 women, 7 men, 8 children, 1 unborn fetus. Nine of the victims came from one family. All these people were killed, and we pray, deliver us from evil? But who was the victim of evil? Those who prayed the prayer or the one who rejected the prayer? Who was the true victim here? Was it the 26 people who worshipped God or the one who rejected God? Who was the true victim here? Was it the 26 martyrs who the book of Revelation says will have their blood avenged by God? Or was it the man whose last last acts in life were murder? Verse 15 of our text says, Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in them. Who's truly the victim here? In verse 14, John also says, We... We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. But anyone who does not love remains in death. You see, about this time last week, 26 people who in truth had already passed from death to life through their love and their acceptance of Jesus Christ, they inherited their eternal reward. The timing was not of their or their family's choosing, but that's what occurred. But one tormented soul was lost because love was not in him. And therefore, he remains, according to Scripture, in death. And that should not sit well with us. There are tormented souls out there that are victims of evil, and we must continue to do all that we can for their deliverance. There are perceived enemies of ours who are the victims of evil. We might call them atheists. Muslims, liars, thieves, murderers, and that list could go on and on and on. But our love for them has to be absolute. We must not replicate their hatred because if we do, we are therefore like Cain. No, we must imitate the one who delivered us from evil. Verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. In my second week of being here in Clearwater, I offered an illustration that I repeat right now. Hopefully, some of your memories aren't too great. A number of you wouldn't have been here, but it serves as the perfect illustration. And it's a story that goes back to Poland before the fall of the Iron Curtain. Poland was a communist country. And although congregations gathered to worship, they were always at the mercy of the Polish secret police, who it seemed had sort of carte blanche when it came to law and order. 
And so it was one day this church of about a hundred or so believers had gathered to worship. And as the pastor approached the podium, suddenly the back doors opened and in walked four men with rifles and they stood in the four corners of that chapel. They lifted their rifles and they pointed them at the congregation. A fifth man walked down the center of the aisle, stood at the front. And he said, in five minutes, every person in this church, every Christian here is going to be shot. However, you have five minutes to leave if you wish. And so immediately people started to cry and scream. Many people gathered their belongings, grabbed what they could, grabbed anything, and just flew out that door, leaving about 30 people. And then the man at the front said, in three minutes, every person, every Christian in this room will be shot. But you still have time to leave. If you want to leave, do it now. And still some more people gathered what they had. Husbands were saying goodbye to wives. There was crying, there was weeping, until about 15 people were left in that chapel. As the man at the front said, in one minute, every person in this room will die. You still can leave, but in one minute we will kill you. But what you had now was 15 people. The pastor had stopped remonstrating. He had sat down, and and like the rest of them, all you heard now was the gentle muttering, of prayer and then suddenly the four rifles clicked as they were disengaged and the man at the front said please excuse our crude methods we've recently come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ but we need to know more and we need to know it from the real thing that's a remarkable story of 15 people who are truly living and who are ready to give up their lives for the sake of Christ. It's a story of five men who were brought to a full understanding of salvation. And this is why we pray, deliver us from evil. This is why we say God continue to protect our souls from evil, that we might one day inherit eternity. But maybe we be willing in faith to offer our lives up for the sake of another's salvation. Friends, I don't know what God is going to do with what happened in Sutherland Springs, Texas. To the outsider looking in, it is nothing but horrible and horrendous. But my experience is that through the death of these 26 who we believe have inherited eternal life, that others will come to an understanding of Jesus Christ. That they will be delivered from evil as those 26 were. And our prayer should continue to be that we have less and less people like Devon Patrick Kelly, lives and souls who are so lost that we can see no way that they're spending eternity in heaven. Friends, this morning, we're going to sing that chorus Lord, make Calvary real to me. And as we sing this chorus, I want you to come and kneel at this place. It's always available, always ready, but we make a particular emphasis now. I want you to come kneel at this place. Don't worry about the clock. There's plenty of time this morning. But there's a world out there that needs prayer, and there are people who need to be delivered from evil, from the evil one. And so this morning has reflected on something that's been on all of our minds this week. I invite you to make it a matter of prayer. Praying for the families and victims. Boy, those families need it. But praying also for the world out there, for people who are like Devon Patrick Kelly, who are tormented, who are lost, and who need deliverance from the evil one who has them in his grasp. This morning, those are noble prayers. I invite you to come and to kneel here this morning as we sing this chorus.
remembered something that, that is so horrible, that has put us all on edge, made us all a little more frightened. So first of all, Lord, for us, we who are saved, we who are believers, we who believe in, in, in life everlasting and that our souls will reside there, I pray, Lord, for a special kind of confidence that we may not be fearful, but that we might rest on that prayer that we've been delivered from the evil one. But Lord, may we also be particularly mindful of the so many people who are out there that we have labeled, and that we have pointed fingers at, that perhaps even in our own mind we have considered lost. Heavenly Father, help us to remember that our job is to go find them. Our job is to partner with you on the salvation of their souls, to bring them to you, and that you, Heavenly Father, will deliver them from evil. Help us to realize, Lord, who the true victim is in the story of Sutherland Springs. As awful as this is in a human sense, the loss of that one soul is tragic in the spiritual sense. Heavenly Father, continue to, to remind us of the importance of being you in this world. I want to sing that chorus again, but I want us to sing it a bit different. Lord, make Calvary real to them. I want us to think of those people who are lost. Lord, make Calvary real to them. Open their eyes to see victory in Christ for, it doesn't rhyme, but them. Lord, make Calvary real to them. Let's make that our prayer this morning. Join me. Lord. I know for others, Heavenly Father, there is, a, there is a desire to have come forward, but maybe the body isn't working quite the way and it's, it's easier to sit and pray where we are. My, my hope is, Lord, that each one of us is praying this prayer right now. It is a prayer surely of urgency. It is a prayer perhaps of desperation. But it's not a prayer, I don't think, Lord, for ourselves because if we truly believe that you have us, we've already been delivered. But Lord, may the urgency just be for those lost. And so Lord, for each person as they pray that most noble of prayers this morning, for the salvation of others, for the deliverance of others, I pray Lord that you will, you will meet that need, you will answer those prayers. I believe Lord God in the, in the concept of free will, I do. But I also believe Heavenly Father that you are continually working, giving opportunities pointing the way to the most lost of people. And therefore, Lord, the importance of us and our role is huge. Help us to believe that, Lord, that you are continuing to point people to eternity with you. But our responsibility and our role is to come alongside them and you, Lord, in that ministry. So this morning, Heavenly Father, what a joy it's been to worship in this place. What a joy it's been to remember, perhaps, what you have done for us and how we thank you, Lord, for the fact that even the most awful of circumstances and situations, that we can look as people of faith and see you even in the midst of that. Bless us now, Lord, as we finish this time in Jesus' name.